Hey guys, we'll be taking next week off, but we'll be back the following week for a brand new episode. In the meantime, enjoy part two of Lorena Bobbitt and stay safe and healthy. After the media got a hold of the initial details of the case, the circus began. But the truth would come out via the testimony of dozens of witnesses at trial. One woman was both a defendant and a victim, and the trial focused on the reign of terror she had endured. But the verdict wasn't the end of her story. This week's episode is Lorena Bobbitt, Part 2. Up uh, in the night, your heart fills with dread. Probably a murderer who wants you dead. It could be a ghost, a demon, or worse. Perhaps you're the victim of a witch's curse. It's hopeless, you're doomed. You'd call a priest if you could. You'd rather just listen to who? Sinisterhood. I'm gonna kill you. How are you? Oh my goodness, just, uh, you know, try not to lose it. I found my glasses, oh, so that good. was nice. Where were they? They were in a, I lost them, I don't know, months ago, and it turns out they were underneath my television in a bucket with DVDs, so no clue how they got All there, right. but did a wine night on Zoom, and my sister organized a scavenger hunt where you had to, like, run around in your house, and, like, whoever came back first, you got points, and you won. Oh, that's fun. It was super fun, and one of the things was a DVD, so I ran to get a DVD and was so excited to also oh, have my glasses. you found your glasses at the same time. What, probably what she did not consider was that one item was a screwdriver, potato peeler, pen. These are all very sharp objects that we were all Running carelessly around the house spent. with. And I didn't tell Paris, and I had the baby gate up to keep the dogs out. So I, like, run out, knock the gate over. I'm, like, throwing things on the ground. He's like, what's going on? I was like, get away from me. While Just you're trying to consuming a- wine. I was trying to. Con- um, Sounds I very a, safe. All I had was a white claw, and there's no, there's no law with the claw. Oh, so. you know, I've never was, had a white claw. I happen to have because I, I have a wine, but I was like, I'm not going to drink a whole bottle of wine. I want to open it, and so I went in my garage of like old party drinks that I've had for a while, and had some white claw. Is it like a so it Lacroix old. but with alcohol? Yep, that's exactly what it's like. Okay. So I drank an old white claw. Nice. <laughs> That's what happens in the quarantine. Hey, what about y'all? Corn claw. <laughs> yeah, there's a, I have not been drinking, but I don't really drink, but i yeah. um, been playing a lot of Animal Crossing. Oh yeah. So, so with that, you love it? Oh yeah. It's, uh, there's now a DCH Facebook group <laughs> that is specifically oh, for Animal Crossing. Yeah. It's, it's, it's a lot of fun. It becomes very you could lose you can lose time you can just That's what I was, for hours well, does it make you like because you know back in the day when they'd like farmville or if you have the sims and stuff it almost it rewards you for spending more time on it or like you you can cultivate more the more time you spend does it kind of get you that way or is it just so relaxing that you just don't even want to turn it off yeah i don't think it i mean there's always something to do but you also can just do nothing just fish and uh, pick up seashells or just run around and catch butterflies with your net it's just soothing and but there's always things you can do to advance kind of your tasks and storyline and to get things to build your island up but it's uh tommy and i play it together well we oh, each great. have characters we don't we don't really play it together because it's a whole thing but um we all we both live on the same island and we we'll play it while we're in the same room and like make decisions about it together and stuff. So oh, that's fun. Super fun. But he, uh, we started over so I could be the leader. So he really took one for the team. Wow. So yep. you had to wipe out his we progress. Had, we had to wipe out our, our progress and start Both of y'all. because you can only have one Island per switch. It's a whole thing. Oh. So, but, and only one person on the Island can be the leader and the leader gets to do more stuff in this storyline so we wiped out our island started from scratch but you know what sometimes you got to do that you know what sometimes you got to start from scratch it's all about uh new beginnings over here that's right you rose like a phoenix (laughs) from the ashes of your previous island i rearranged our refrigerator to make it more efficient that's excellent where i'm at in my quarantine (laughs) like how can i make our fridge more efficient that's what I felt like a lunatic because we made that Dunder Mifflin set and then I found my two Ghostbuster sets and I was like, 
hold the iPhone. I'm going to make a movie. And he was like, oh, God. And I felt like Ben Wyatt on Parks and Rec whenever he made his little stop motion. And he's like, would a depressed person make this? I was like, we're starting to lose it. Yeah. There's only so much you can do to entertain yourself, especially when you have a two-year-old. That too. I was the other day, I was like, I'd really like to, we have this 3D Game of Thrones puzzle that we've had for probably two years. And I was like, I'd love Mm -hmm. to do this puzzle. And I was like, I can't do this puzzle. There's no room in the house that Ella can't get to. So this puzzle will end up everywhere. Yeah. 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 I saw a meme the other day that was quarantine life without kids. And it was like people doing puzzles, reading, enjoying a glass of wine, painting, exercising. And it was like with kids. And it's just pure chaos that's what shannon is my sister and her husband are handling right now because they both are working from home and have to take turns and that kid just all the time yeah just i mean that's same. how i mean they're pretty much the same age they're yep. just all the She's, time uh, ella's a year younger i believe but yeah it's yeah. um it's there's no relaxing there's no, no you know what i'm gonna do a puzzle for the next hour no there's none of that it's it's a shit show and my hat's off to everyone, parents and non-parents that are dealing Surviving. with this. Yeah, because we're all, we're all learning to adjust and it's, I don't know. I don't think there's an end in sight, quite frankly. <laughs> Not <laughs> no, anytime I, soon. You, here's my theory. It's Matt Damon on 30 Rock when he played the pilot carol and he comes back and he goes hey everybody it'll be about a half an hour and then two hours later he goes i think it's going to be about a half an hour yep. and tina fey's like what do you mean he goes it's enough time so people know they have to wait but not too much time that they freak out and i'm like that's what this is that's, they're like yeah. we're gonna go two more weeks maybe okay one more month they're they're not going to tell you that it's going to be until no, no, no. september they're gonna they're doing matt damon on 30 rock yeah. that's what this is that's what i told tommy the other day that's why i was surprised that dallas already extended it to may 20th because i thought i knew for sure they would extend it but i thought they'd wait until the end of april so everyone kind of had that hope but now that they've already extended it i'm like they full-on well know that it's gonna it's, it's just keep getting well, then they extended said, well the disaster declarations till may 20th right now the shelter in place is only until april 30th but i can extend it till may 20th whenever yeah. i want and you're like you're going to yeah and <laughs> and you should because yeah uh that park over by our house still packed every day i drove to my pharmacies in uptown by my office so i went to do the drive through pharmacy and driving through uptown people were walking three and four abreast on the sidewalk passing each other it was just like nothing yeah. was wrong and that's why we'll all be stuck in our houses through the fall <laughs> until flu season yeah until christmas my goodness well um here's a little something that's could maybe take your mind off of things but it's certainly not joyful or happy not really cheerful no No, it's not i mean it has a has a happy ending for her i think sure yes it does that's true well this is a second part of our lorena bobbitt series if you haven't listened to the first one go back and do that because a lot of it a lot of what happened in the in the first one is going to come up in the trials which was what Mm -hmm. we'll be talking about today Indeed. So let's get into it. On November 8th, 1993, John Bobbitt was tried for marital sexual assault of Lorena Bobbitt. Before a wave of change came through the United States criminal justice system in the mid-1990s, rape was defined as a man having non-consensual sex with a woman, not his wife. This meant that in many places by law, a man could not rape his wife. The law in Virginia allowed a husband to be charged with marital rape only if either the couple lived separately or the wife was seriously physically injured during the attack. Due to this, prosecutors charged John under the statute of marital sexual assault, a law that had only gone into effect seven months prior to the trial. It took a ton of uh, work, grassroots efforts, and pressuring legislatures across the country because that's not a federal crime. So it's not something that they could just enact at the federal level, state by state by state, to enact the laws that would protect women. That it doesn't matter if you are married to someone, you can still say no. It is crazy to me that this wasn't too long ago and that rape did not exist in marriages. In the marital bedroom, one could not Mm -mm. be raped. 
it says it in the statute. You know, a man rapes a woman, not his wife, though. And you're that's, like, don't you didn't need to add, just cut that out? That's crazy. It's it's horrible. Do all states? Is it worldwide now that it that's not a thing anymore? I can't say worldwide, but in the United States, yeah. Okay. John faced up to twenty years in jail. Because the crime at issue was a sex crime, the trial was not allowed to be filmed, and there is no footage of the trial. The trial lasted two days, where the testimony focused only on the five days leading up to the incident of rape at issue. This was due to the limitations Virginia law places on presenting evidence of a defendant's prior conduct. Rule 404b2 of the Rules of Evidence states that, Evidence of other crimes, wrongs, or acts is generally not admissible to prove the character trait of a person in order to show that the person acted in conformity therewith. That's like a frustrating, and they mention it specifically in the documentary, and it is frustrating because he did not just rape her one time. No. This was by repeated over and over again and also just seriously physically abused her. But because the probative value of the prior attacks would be unduly prejudicial to john the judge basically limited it to the five days before the incident because otherwise you get into okay well we open the door to every other time he's attacked her then that's going to be basically what ends up being her trial 50 witnesses or whatever coming in and saying two years ago i knew her and she came in with a bruise on her face and i'm her doctor and she came in because she was raped a year ago and so that mass of evidence doesn't go to prove that he committed this rape that they're talking about that happened the Friday before. How frustrating for her to sit there and know. I mean, and she even says in the documentary, so much went on for years that led up to that five days prior, didn't even begin to scratch the surface. And, and it didn't paint the picture. And in my opinion, couldn't paint an accurate picture of what was going on. Five days Not is all. nothing. That's and like, the, what if he's having a good week that week? You know what I mean? Like, he got a promotion or something yeah, and was happy for yeah. once. Yeah. But the one woman that ends up testifying at the other trial, you know, she regretted not coming in because this she witnessed the bruises on Lorena's arm that week but that woman was a Keegan was her last name and we'll talk about her in John's trial but she was a client in Lorena's trial, in Lorena's trial but she was a client of Lorena's at the salon and saw the bruises and stuff that week but it's one of those where so many people saw that it's like how do you even call that many you know how did how would Lorena go and track those people down so she ended up missing out on that lady but the lady ended up coming forward at, later but yeah, you when you cut it down that much, it, you can kind of see why they do it under the rules of evidence. But it does, as a victim, you're like, but he, I mean, this isn't the first time. Yeah. The Commonwealth called nine witnesses to testify at trial. The, def the defense brought a dozen witnesses to support John's side of the story. One of those was a neighbor with an adjoining wall who testified there was no sounds of screams on the night of the incident. The defense presented this as evidence that no rape had occurred. However, when the neighbor was asked whether they heard any noises later when nearly a dozen police officers arrived to search the apartment, the neighbor confirmed they heard nothing. Maybe well-insulated walls. Lorena claimed that night that John had ripped off her underwear. The underwear she wore had an eight-inch tear, but the defense called an FBI forensic specialist who testified that the tear was really made by scissors. The prosecution called his own forensic specialist, who said the underwear was torn. With some force. So you're just going to have he said, she said type of situation throughout the whole trial. They're going to call dueling their... dueling experts. Yeah, they're going to call their specialist, you're going to call yours. And it, it just comes down to who the jury thinks is more sympathetic and makes a better, better argument. Absolutely. The emergency room physician who performed Lorena's physical exam implied that because Lorena was very calm during the rape exam, she hadn't been attacked, as most rape victims are hysterical. I think that this snooty ass person has not encountered someone who has been traumatized repeatedly over the course of years. Yeah, that this was not she wasn't pulled over in an alley and attacked. This was like a weekly event. And even so, everyone processes grief and shock differently. There's no textbook way that somebody's going to react when they go in to get a rape kit done. Yeah, but they always do this. You're like, you don't know that person. You don't know what their right. background and their history is. 
The jury, made up of nine women and three men, deliberated a mere four hours. John was acquitted of marital sexual assault. The jurors later spoke to the New York Times, telling the paper that initially the jury was split six to six, but convincing opening and closing statements by John's lawyers convinced them that the case was circumstantial and based solely on Lorena's testimony. One of the jurors told the New York Times, If someone had heard her scream or if there had been some sort of bruising, that, that would have been more substantive evidence, but everything was pretty circumstantial and could have been interpreted several ways. He elaborated to the Times the jurors weren't interested in making this some sort of rallying point that women don't have anywhere to go if they're abused. According to the article, another juror suggested issuing as some sort of feminist statement as the jury read the verdict. But the juror told the paper, we decided we had to stick to the facts and not make this a political statement. It is a political statement. Uh, <laughs> though. This is the issue with juries. Just overall. Yeah, I mean, I've said it before, like, I mean, you do want a, p a juror, jury of your peers hearing your case, but everyone has biases, everyone has mm -hmm. opinions, and when you get people that clearly are like, well, we're not interested in making this about some political statement about women that are just abused and stuff, this person sounds very sexist. Mm -hmm. Like they're, they have the privilege of not making it a political yeah. statement. When the verdict was read, according to the New York Times, John jumped up and pumped his fist in the air while his excited mother shrieked behind him. Well, that does not seem very courtroom professional. Not an appropriate reaction. <laughs> However, that joy would be short-lived. John was contemporaneously served with a lawsuit from a woman in New York who claimed he was the father of her baby. Blood tests reveal that there was a 99.999% likelihood that John was the father. The timing indicated that John fathered this child three months before the incident with Lorena. After paternity was determined, John failed to pay child support, eventually owing over thirty grand to the baby's mother. He later skipped child support meetings in an attempt to avoid paying. I like that the, his lawyer goes, uh, 99.99%, so you're saying there's a chance. He's like, <laughs> he's like, we don't totally trust this whole DNA thing. I mean, granted, it was the 90s, but it was like, it, it, it's a that's his kid. Yeah, absolutely. And it just goes to show what a piece of shit he, he is. He, he fathered this kid. He refuses to pay child support, starts skipping out on meetings. He was also, as Lorena knew, being unfaithful to her while, mm -hmm. while they were married. Who knows who else he was banging during this time? It's true. And this is a man who just things constantly go wrong for him. And he goes, I don't know why all these things are going wrong. Yeah. It's like you, you always, are the why. Always the victim. Never exactly. takes any responsibility. Never. Lorena's trial began a couple months later, in January of 1994. She was being tried for malicious assault. Because the Commonwealth of Virginia didn't consider malicious wounding to be a sex crime, even given the member that was wounded, the trial was able to be televised on court TV. This Man, is crazy 90s, to me. This is so crazy the 90s to me. Were just a, they were just a time for trials. Oh, yeah. The, it, it is bizarre how many just gripping courtroom trials there were during the 90s back to back to back mm -hmm. it was oj menendez this then tanya harding yeah I mean, it was and then the anita hill thing was going on has there been anything since then that's been Casey like Anthony that? was Casey my mom Anthony. watched Casey Anthony. Yeah. But I mean like where there was like five huge trials within a, the same year. Yeah, not really back to back. And the the um George Zimmerman trial I remember watching. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Man, I, what was the most recent? There was a big one recently that was Was Jody Arias aired? I don't know. Yeah. I don't know. I don't have cable. That's I, where they're all. I remember aired watching at. OJ. I remember mm -hmm. watching the Menendez, and even this one. I remember this one too. Mm -hmm. But it's it is wild that his was not to be televised, and hers was. Yeah, because well, and for her privacy, but you know, on both, the more is revealed at her trial than at his. You know. Yeah. The trial lasted for eight days and included testimony from 48 witnesses, according to the New York Times. The witnesses included people who knew the Bobbitts, as well as experts in psychology. Of the acquaintances and friends, several testified that they frequently saw Lorena covered in bruises. 
Other friends testified that they never saw her bruised or heard her complain of abuse. I would assume those would be people that are more his friends or yeah. maybe she's, she doesn't feel close with because it's not like she's telling everybody. And she frequently wore long sleeves, as many abuse victims do. If The fact that there's people testifying they never heard her say anything or saw means nothing, in my opinion. No. You could have... 10 friends one of them knows about it and the other nine don't that doesn't mean that it didn't happen correct yeah blair howard lorena's attorney said in the lorena documentary we were putting forth a defensive uh, form of insanity in virginia that defense was anchored on the proposition that she had undergone a great deal of trauma and that night was the trigger he presented evidence that john told lorena I will find you, whether we're divorced or separated, and wherever I find you, I'll have sex with you whenever I want to. It was this threat that caused Lorena to attempt to save herself by removing his penis. The defense hung on the idea that Lorena was subjected to a reign of terror, and that Lorena believed at the time of the knifing incident it was her only way out. Well, that's fair, given yeah. what he said. <laughs> yes. If... I will find you, whether we're divorced or separated, and wherever I find you, I'll have sex with you whenever I want to. I believe he also said, however I want to, which yeah. means, if, so of course, if she's, what's, if you remove his penis, guess what he can't do anymore? Exactly. Rape you. You backed her into a corner, man. One of Lorena's clients at the salon, Roma Anastasi told jurors that over the course of three and a half years, she saw Lorena crumble emotionally until she was nearly unrecognizable. Roma testified that Lorena was extremely distressed and depressed, very sad, a lot of anxiety. Connie James, one of Lorena's co-workers, testified that she and Lorena had a conversation about what they would do if they found out their husbands had cheated on them. Connie told Lorena she'd pack up and leave her husband. Meanwhile, Connie testified that Lorena told her... I would cut his dick off because that would hurt him more than just killing him. She wasn't wrong. I mean... <laughs> and she's also not... She knew that he was cheating on her. And mm -hmm. he claims this is why all this went down. That she knew he was cheating and because he told her, I want to get divorced. And she flipped out and lost her mind. But... I... It speaks a lot that she knew... His dick and ha and having sex with women and and his sexual machismo meant more to him than his actual life. It's true, and that's wasn't that what his brother said too? Yeah. Of like, that's the only thing that matters. Yeah, and she knew before the incident that he uh, was cheating because he made a list of women he was sleeping with and had slept with and wanted to sleep with. And at one point, the allegation was that he raped her and read the list to her. That's crazy. Wow. Yeah, just a form of control. Yeah. Lorena testified about the first time John had hit her after she pleaded with him to slow down as he drunkenly drove them home from a bar. I couldn't understand why the person I loved treated me that way. I was in shock. I couldn't believe that. I was embarrassed to tell people also. Still, Lorena testified that she remained hopeful after that first incident, saying, I thought he would change and was never going to do that again. We talked we about that more in the first episode, kind of go into detail of what happened the first time he hit her. This was a month into their marriage that the mm -hmm. physical abuse started. But even after that, and this is very common in women that are, that are abused, she thought, I can stay. This was just a one-time thing. He'll change. It's never going to happen again. And very rarely is it a one-time thing. Yeah, it is not. And she uh, would always get hopeful, like, oh, if he got this new job, he'll stop abusing me. Oh, if he, yeah. if only I look better or dress better or whatever. And then even she, when she gets pregnant, she thinks, oh, okay, well, I'm pregnant and now we'll have a baby. And it, he ends up, you know, making her have an abortion. Yeah. And it and still and still abused her, you yeah. know, before, during, and after the pregnancy. So. Lorena went on to detail 12 more instances of assault, including punching, kicking, and verbal abuse. Some neighbors in Maplewood Park Apartments, including Will Hall and Jonathan Kalapua, both witnessed incidents of abuse. One detail they both pointed out in the Lorena documentary was the physical discrepancy between John, who weighed about 200 pounds, and Lorena, who weighed a mere 93. 
Neighbors also witnessed incidents of dominance from John, including small slights, like forcing Lorena to carry all the groceries into the house, while he walked all macho behind her. These two dudes from the apartment complex are, you know, they both say, we felt like it was our place to testify. We saw this. We wanted we wanted to step up because if somebody treated my mom or my sister or anybody like that, you know, they needed they need somebody to stand up for them, too. And it's like, I mean, at the time, you know, why didn't you go do something at the time? Well, domestic violence calls are the dangerous, most dangerous calls for yeah. police officers, much less an unarmed neighbor. Also, but Jonathan was friends with him. They, he and he and, and he's like, oh, yeah, they were they were friends and hung out and stuff. So but yeah. And was it Will that in the documentary talks about how his mom, he witnessed his mom get mm-hmm. the shit beat out of her by their dad growing up. And he always vowed, I will never let that happen to any woman under my watch. And so mm-hmm. when he if started can help. Yeah. When he started hearing about this and John even started talking about stuff is when they finally went to the police. When officers had searched the Bobbitt house the night of the incident, they found pamphlets about domestic violence and rape. Those were given to Lorena by Ella Jones, an elderly neighbor who testified at trial. Ella told the jury that she frequently heard banging around and screaming. After Lorena confessed to Ella that she had been repeatedly raped, Ella, a survivor of domestic violence herself, provided the pamphlets. Yeah, she lived down beneath them. Yeah. A parade of additional witnesses testified to incidents where John pulled Lorena's hair, grabbed her, and left marks. Some were bruises on her back, while others were marks and bruises on her hips and in her thighs. It was all over, man. The photos were terrifying. Oh, they're they're heartbreaking. Additionally, three of John's friends testified to John's sexual proclivities. John reportedly told them he liked to make women scream and make them bleed— He had a predilection for anal sex and particularly enjoyed taking it by force. One friend testified that John said, The way he liked to have sex was uh, forced sex because that turned him on and that he liked to F them up the ass and have them scream and squirm away. He said that turned him on. Okay, it's hor that's horrifying. Yeah, and apparently he said it while they were like playing basketball, just hanging out. That's what I was going to say. It's even more horrifying that he casually talks about this like it's just you know guy talk that locker room it, yeah talk. locker room that nothing will be uh, no one is going to think this is weird or inappropriate or s- disgusting and violent that's how just every day this kind of behavior was to him he grew mm-hmm. up watching his mom get the shit, shit beat out of him he claims he and his siblings and everything were molested and had the shit beaten out of them and then his brother sees him beating his wife and is fine with it even encourages it Mm -hmm. so he it's he doesn't even there's such a disconnect between this is actually something it's it's again like we've talked about before i wonder does he he knows what he's doing because like you said in the first episode when the cops show up in that the first time he changes his behavior and acts like Mm -hmm. everything's fine so clearly he knows what he's doing is wrong to some people Mm -hmm. but then i guess he feels so comfortable with others that he thinks he can just talk about this like it's just the weather yeah and i think maybe maybe because he is kind of sexually messed up obviously if this is his Mm -hmm. proclivity that he doesn't know it's messed up he just thinks that's how it is and if that's what makes him happy he's like other guys probably like this too yeah john was called to the stand in order to determine his credibility when asked if he had ever assaulted his wife john testified that he Uh, held her down and pushed restrained shoved or grabbed her many times in order to keep her from hurting him despite having court documents showing his signature where he pled guilty to the battery on previous charges john completely denied it ever happened and claimed he had never seen the form with his signature on it yeah he he was a very bad witness (laughs) it's so wild when he's testifying and the prosecution just straight hands him that piece of paper they're like do you remember signing this in front of a cop when you pleaded that you had hit your wife? Nope, never seen this before. Is that your signature on it? Yeah. You never seen this before? Nope. It's like, how can all of these I things mean, be true? What's happening yeah, right now? He maybe was drunk. I mean, but he still knows it all happened. I mean, you'd have to wake up the next day and think, man, was a cop here? 
But he just straight up lied. And I think he's a smarmy piece of shit and thought he was mm-hmm. smarter than everybody. Yes. And I feel for that prosecutor who had, you know, previously prosecuted him and I think thought he was a shithead and deserved basically to to be convicted for the marital sexual assault. But then was forced to it's basically his victim in this case. But he's having to, you know, kind of go easy on him because the prosecutor is his I mean, that's not his client, but, you know, I mean, the prosecutor is here on behalf of the victim and the defense attorney is, you know, making him look like an idiot. And the prosecutor is just like, yeah, do what you got to do, man, because he sucks. I know he's my victim, but he sucks. That's crazy. At the trial, Lorena testified that she was in such a state of shock the night of the incident that she didn't even realize what had happened until she found herself driving down the road with a penis in one hand and a knife in the other. The defense argued that Lorena was in such a depressive and traumatized state that she suffered from post-traumatic stress disorder when the incident occurred. Dr. Susan Feister, who had worked with many women over the years that had been subjected to rape and prolonged domestic abuse, testified as a defense witness. She also agreed that Lorena suffered from depressive disorder, post-traumatic stress disorder, and anxiety disorder or panic disorder, which caused Lorena to lose control of her impulses. According to Dr. Feister, the years of constant torture left Lorena with no way out, except to attack the instrument of her torture. That is John's penis. In her medical opinion, Dr. Feister testified that her behavior was consistent with irresistible impulse. As it was defined under Virginia law. Does Texas have this law? Um, I would have to check. I know that you can have not guilty by reason of mental disease or defect. And then under that, there's case law that has outlined what the definition of that would be. Um, And a lot of times I know in Texas, when we talked about in the machete case, it's not knowing at the time that the thing you're doing is wrong, which in her case, I mean, I would say the Texas definition would fit because, you know, she cuts it off and goes and gets in her car and she's kind of aimlessly driving around. It's not like she... Like we said, she didn't go and, like, grind it up in the garbage disposal. She was, like, totally dazed until yeah. she got to that Seven Eleven. and was like, what the hell's in my hand? Oh, my yeah. God. Dr. Evan Nelson, a state forensic psychologist who testified at trial, was interviewed for the Lorena documentary. He laid out the requirements for the irresistible impulse defense. First, a person must have an underlying mental disorder. In Lorena's case, this was her PTSD and her anxiety and depressive disorders. Then, because of that mental disorder, the defendant is unable to stop herself from acting. At trial and in later interviews, Dr. Nelson insisted that Lorena was merely angry and did not meet the requirements for the defense. He also testified that what John did to her that night was only what Lorena perceived as a rape and claimed she was capable of walking away, saying, From my perspective, I couldn't say that this was insanity. Well, this man's an idiot. Uh, It sucks, too, because he's the one that later treats her. So that's unfortunate that someone testifies at trial that they think that you're making it up. And then they're the one that has to. There's a lot of that in this trial. A lot of on in this trial, I'm on your side. And then in the next trial, I'm on the on the other side. I'm on the opposite side. Is that yeah. Is that normal? Like the prosecutor that defended John, but then also to prosecute him? Yeah, the prosecutor at the time was questioned of whether he should step down or whether, you know, he should let somebody else, you know, take one of the cases. And he said, I don't see these two things in conflict. Gosh, (laughs) I I mean, if you can compartmentalize like that, I guess not. But to me, I don't know how you could get so passionate and dedicated to one case and feel Mm -hmm. so strongly about it that you can say my 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 client is innocent and then a few months later you flip that around i mean for his his argument was that he doesn't represent any person he represents the The state state, the commonwealth and he's like i represent the commonwealth of virginia and whoever's in front of me if your actions have broken the law i regardless my utmost dedication is to the state so i'll say you know you broke it i think if you watch interviews with him back in the day and more recent ones and then watch the trial footage she was lucky and it could have gone the other way. I think he knew John was full of shit. He knew John was raped her. There was not 
a witness in the five day period that he knew of at the time of John's trial that he could have put that he was able to put on the stand. He found one later and put her on the stand in this one. But and at the time, whenever he found her after, you know, John was acquitted, he said, oh, son of a bitch, if I would have known you, we would have put him away. Mm -hmm. And at Lorena's trial, there's a couple of witnesses that he could have cross examined and he just goes, no questions and yeah. sits down. So I was like, I think he he was kind of going going easy on her to yeah yeah. Another forensic psychologist testifying on behalf of the prosecution concurred. Doctor Henry Gwaltney testified that this lady was terribly emotionally aroused, excited, angry, or enraged. But I see no evidence of a psychotic episode. It hurts my heart and soul that medical professionals get on the stand and say things like this it makes you wonder too i mean i've seen expert testimony in real life and always one of the questions always from the other side is how much are you getting paid to be here today yep, because yep. i mean it's six hundred dollars an hour or whatever yeah. i'm testify so they sometimes the people that called them will ask them that up front to just like take this wind out of their sails because when they're going to get, get cross-examined that's going to get up there but from like an ethical perspective that's your license not only that's your integrity on the line yeah. like what is that worth or it's just differing opinions. I don't know. You can have a different opinion, but this is very uh, just this language of this lady was terribly yeah. emotionally aroused, excited, angry. He's he's saying she was aroused and that's what caused her to do. It. It's just mm-hmm. all such like coded language and very just sexist and again painting mm-hmm. her as this hot latino woman who She's just crazy yeah this crazy psychotic bitch instead of someone that was being emotionally sexually and physically tortured for years that had a psychotic break mm-hmm. the jury debated for just under six hours before returning the verdict during deliberation the jury performed a reenactment of the night as lorena had testified it happened Jurors told the L.A. Times that the reenactment was a turning point in the decision making. The jury also asked the judge for clarification on the jury instruction regarding the definition of irresistible impulse. The definition as it was written in the jury instructions required that the jury find Lorena's brain was so impaired by disease that she was unable to resist the impulse to commit the crime. According to the New York Times, The jury asked the judge whether they could use a broader definition that was introduced earlier in the trial by a doctor who testified that that doctor had argued that her actions were too goal-oriented to meet that definition. When the judge told jurors they must stick to the jury charge as it was written, they almost immediately returned with their verdict. This is why there's always a lot of fights over the exact phrasing of the jury charge, especially in criminal, I mean, in civil trials, too, because... It's written, maybe by the prosecutor, in a way that her actions fit it. Yeah. I remember when I was on that trial, I know we had at least one question, maybe two, of the way that the instructions were written that we had to, like, write down and give to the bailiff. And she Mm -hmm. went and gave it to the judge and brought us back and everything. But and that that process was so interesting to me that that's – all you that's literally how it's like passing notes like mm-hmm. it's such a professional and like system and what's going on but like you gotta ask you gotta ask a question okay you gotta write it down on this little slip of paper and i'm gonna go <laughs> hand it to someone and they're gonna bring it back slide it across the desk yeah lorena was found not guilty by reason of temporary insanity on the charge of malicious wounding they also acquitted her of unlawful wounding a lesser included charge one juror who wished to remain anonymous told the L.A. Times, We felt she'd really been abused, you know, a victim. Unfortunately, over a period of time, most of us would be able to react rationally, but uh, we didn't really feel she was strong enough. She'd been stripped of everything at that point. I would like to argue that most of us would be able to react rationally is a ridiculous statement. You don't know how you would react Hell if you've no. been repeatedly anally raped for several years. And, and who then is the- most of us? Most of you jurors? Did you take a poll to yeah. say, like... Hey, hey, hands up if after being anally raped for four years, if you think you could have handled this rationally. You should have just gone to the police, maybe. Yeah. Another juror spoke with the LA Times, described John as... Uh, basically a liar. While yet another juror told the Times... 
there was nothing positive about him. As far as his testimony, none of us got a good feeling about him. Juror Clay Kakalis told the Lorena filmmakers that there was a... A pretty appalling record of abuse in that marriage. Yeah, he was a terrible witness. I mean, yeah. I, I, was there any way that he could have not been put on the stand or did he have to be put on the stand uh, from, I mean, from his attorney's point of view? Well, I mean, if the prosecution's going to call you, they're yeah, going to call true. you. Yeah, so he, you know, he got called, but he was it seemed terrible. like he had not been coached well at all on what to Can- say or how to behave. I bet you he was coached and he thought he was smarter than everybody. And yeah. was like, I'm going to say whatever I'm going to say. Go That's fuck true. yourself. He definitely I have... did not come across as a sympathetic figure in no. the least. He's always like, I have nothing to hide. And especially when they go, have you ever held her down? He's like, yeah, all the time. Yeah. That I do was it all the time. crazy. He's like, like, again, like th- telling his friends, oh, yeah, the way I like to have sex is F him up the ass and make him bleed so they and, and hold him down. It's like nothing. And he in his testimony, he's like. Yeah, I held her down all the time. Yeah, I'd hit her. I'd push her off of me because she was hitting me. She, a 93-pound woman, was hitting Mm -hmm. me, a 200-pound man. But he acted like it was his right to do that. Like, of course, he he was insulted that someone would even question if he did that because it's so commonplace. Of course he did. Yeah, he was almost irritated. They go, you ever grab her by the wrist? Yeah, obviously. Yeah. Idiot. It's like, yeah, yeah. no, nobody else does that. Big fat idiot. I do it all the time. Don't you? Yeah, people don't do that. No, you don't because that's abuse. Mm Mm-hmm. Once the verdict was read, Lorena asked her attorney what it meant, according to the New York Times. He told Lorena, you're free. But this wasn't exactly true. Because she had been acquitted based on a plea of insanity, Lorena was mandated to undergo a psychiatric evaluation to determine whether she was a continuing threat to society or to herself. Lorena was taken to Central State Hospital to undergo treatment. When I got there, when they opened the door, it was all eyes were on me. They all knew who I was. Lorena said of arriving at the state-run mental facility. During her 45-day stay, she was evaluated by two doctors, one psychologist and one psychiatrist, but she did not receive the privacy of the other patients at the facility. News media helicopters flew over the recreational area outdoors, trying to catch a glimpse of her enjoying some rec time. Reporters sent flowers in an attempt to win her favor. Dr. Nelson, a psychologist at the facility, called it very disruptive to the entire facility. Oh, for sure. There were, it was swarms, swarms of journalists. And that's to show up and you're immediate, you're like, well, I'm not really going to get the treatment that I could get if this was, if I was just an everyday person. Mm -mm. Everyone knows who I am. All the other patients know who I am. I already have this stigma and this reputation walking in here. And whether people think, oh, oh, poor pitiful girl had all this stuff happen to her or, wow, she's crazy. I can't believe she yeah. got off. No yeah. matter what, people are thinking something and that's not conducive to a healing environment. Right. Exactly. It's just another thing you have to overcome before you can begin your healing. Barbara Walters showed up outside the mental facility with a full crew and satellite dish in tow, demanding to be let in and granted access to Lorena. Alan Halji, Lorena's media representative, refused to allow Walters to get the interview after Lorena said she wasn't interested. Halji then left the media legend on hold for over an hour, according to the documentary. When Walters later asked why he'd refused to grant the interview, Halji told her, because... You're part of the Illuminati, you're part of the Trilateral Commission, you're part of the feminist movement, and those are all things I didn't want Lorena to have anything to do with. I wanted her to tell her story. This is a shocking development in the documentary. <laughs> because this man seems just like so normal, a nice media representative, like nothing weird about him. And then he comes out with this quote and you're like, oh, wow, you've been holding on to that this whole time. Yeah. What yep. else have he, you got going on in there? Because he sort of, you know, he kind of calmly tells the story and he's like, you know, I put her on hold and I was like, I'm I'm going to check in with Lorena. And then I said, she's in the Illuminati. I was like, oh, <laughs> shit. He's going to pull down like a thing behind him that has like all the red yarn between the connections. I want to know who else he thinks is. I want to know who else he would not grant an interview because <laughs> Regis, he, Regis you were Philbin. part of the trilateral commission <laughs> also his trilateral means there's three so i'm like is it barbara walters <laughs> hugh downs and who's i don't know who the third one is kathy lee oh <laughs> is- barbara walters uh montel williams <laughs> and phil donahue <laughs> oh those glasses old and you know <laughs> oh sally, sally jesse raphael yeah <laughs> she, she's a alternate she's been trying to get on the official commission but not yet 
Lorena was subjected to five weeks of analysis. Eventually, she began talking about her issues and found that after doing so, she was better able to handle the trauma. Dr. Nelson, the state psychologist, told the Lorena documentary makers the trauma is best treated by speaking about the traumatic events until it becomes easier for the patient to talk. And this was the same doctor that said, I don't think she was raped. Yes. Jesus who Christ. Is administering her treatment. That seems so like such a conflict of interest for the hospital's part. I mean, he repre- he works for the state, and so they can call a state psychologist. No, I'm saying if I was Lorena, I would say, oh, yeah. um, hello, no, I'm not going to have this. I don't feel comfortable yeah. having this man treat me because I know he doesn't believe me. Yeah, fuck this guy. <laughs> I mean, trust with your therapist is the number one thing. If you don't have that, then you're nothing good is going to come of those sessions. No, I think she was probably just trying to count down the 45 days. Yeah, exactly. Well, after 45 days, Lorena was conditionally released as she was found to have completed her treatment. In a press conference after her release, she appeared smiling, bright-eyed and confident in front of the microphone, saying that she had decided she wanted to go back to a normal life. If only it was that easy, Lorena. Yeah, poor thing. I mean, she's excited and she makes a joke and they said, what are you going to do now? And she said, maybe I'll go to Disney World. And she's laughing and she just seems like there's color back in her face and she's just happy, you know, before she she's hasn't kinda, been raped for 45 days. You know, she's been safe because, you know, yeah. like it's like we said, when she first got in there, she was literally it's like the Invisible Man movie, which if you have not seen is very scary. It's streaming and, right now. It's for free. Oh, really? Yeah. Yep. I mean, it's. It's frightening, but the parallels to this show or to this case are uh, haunting. But she's just looking around the corner of everywhere and they're like, oh, he's dead or he can't hurt you or you're locked away. And it's like, I feel like I still feel like he's around the corner. So I think finally after the 45 days, she's like, OK, he's gone. I don't have to yeah. worry about him anymore. The media frenzy had been ripe since this story first broke, and it wasn't about to stop just because the trials had come to an end. A disgruntled wife lopping off her husband's member was quite an attention-grabbing headline. SNL aired sketch after sketch, mocking the incident. Robin Williams included a bit in his stand-up special where he used an Ecuadorian accent to mock Lorena. David Letterman included a top-ten list about her. On the surface, the incident may have seemed ripe for mockery. Based on the years of abuse Lorena suffered at John's hand, it was far from a joke. Lorena told the New York Times in 2019, it's like they all missed or didn't care why I did what I did. That the, sums up this entire trial, in my opinion. Absolutely. That it it was all about the what and none about the why. Yep. No, not none. at all. While Lorena was desperate to be out of the headlines, John was determined to stay in the spotlight. In addition to appearances on daytime talk shows, he also appeared multiple times on the Howard Stern show. The documentary Lorena shows clips in which Howard asked John whether he had to uh, smack this new girlfriend around or was she OK? I mean, sometimes they don't listen to you. You know how that is. <laughs> Stern was also quoted as saying, I-, I don't even buy that he was raping her. She's not that great looking. And no creep deserves what that psycho bitch did. We said it in the first episode and we'll say it again. He is a uh, he gets a Golden Juice Award. You know, someone messaged us and said, FYI, listen to Howard Stern. In the last few years, he's come around. He's, like, way better. He's not misogynistic anymore. He does, like, this and this charity work. That's fine. He's he's married to a woman. I think the woman he's married to kind of changed him and turned him around a lot. And she is Mm -hmm. huge into charity work. And I think that was a good influence in his life. So that's nice to hear. And I said, you know what? I'm all about people changing and getting better. I think when you say somebody's canceled, we don't fuck them forever. It's like, you know, there's maybe they have good to do in the world by saying, oh, my God, look how wrong I was. I can't believe I did such horrible things. He has not necessarily no. said that yet. He has not so come that out would and, help. and apologized for anything that Mm-mm. he said about her. He Mm-mm. he paid for John to have penis enlargement surgery. And he also had that that uh, New Year's Eve fundraising they event They did do the fundraiser. Him, where it had a giant bloody penis as the measure that went up or down when people donated money. And he raised like two hundred sixty or $290,000 for him. It was, it was just disgusting. It was all just such a – it was all just a show and an act. And like you said in the first one, I don't think it's a bit. If it was a bit, it was – 
taken way too far and was not funny. Mm-mm. The, all those sketches on SNL were rough to watch. And, yeah. Ugh. There's a lot of old SNL stuff that's real wet, rough to watch. It's Yeah. yeah. In 2019, Lorena graciously told Variety that Howard Stern simply didn't know the facts and missed an opportunity to have a national conversation about domestic violence and marital rape. Despite his appearances on Stern, John found himself facing a mountain of legal and medical bills. Due to the media interest in the case, he attempted to capitalize on his newfound fame. He first tried forming a band called The Severed Parts. However, when that failed, he turned to making pornography. His first appearance was in a film titled John Wayne Bobbitt, Uncut, directed by Ron Jeremy. John told Vanity Fair in 2019 that he thought, A porno seemed like the best way to show my penis worked. But lamented that, Only it wasn't all the way healed yet. I realize now that was the point. According to Refinery29, Ron Jeremy says it is one of the highest grossing films he's ever produced. Dr. John Seen, the urologist who performed surgery on John, told the makers of the Lorena documentary, I was happy to see the porn film eventually to see my handiwork was working well. That's all I really cared about. I'm glad. I'm glad you're happy, sir. <laughs> he had to tell his wife when he brought the tape home, it's for work. This is it's, research. And this is for I, research. First of all, honey, I'd like you to come see what I was doing at the office all day. <laughs> but how bizarre to be like, oh, I did that. And now this is being used in this way. He's like, hell yeah, look at that. I yeah, can't the- imagine this guy has ever operated on a penis and then seen it, seen that penis have sex. You know what? That's true. This may be like a new, for him, it's like a milestone in his career <laughs> <laughs> that he's just like stoked. But they're, I'll link it in the show notes just in case anyone's morbidly curious. The review that Entertainment Weekly did I, of it was scathing. I, it made my stomach turn and that's why it's not included in this. Yeah. Because, he just did, uh, they were scathing. Well, and just the description of the porn in general. Yeah. It made my do. stomach hurt. No, but I do like they say it was a pretty bad movie, even by porn standards. Yeah, like, it well, wasn't even good. It was just all literally all it was was exploitative. According to Greg Murphy, John's defense attorney, John expected to make millions for the porn appearances, but got totally taken advantage of. John went through a Chapter 11 bankruptcy to avoid his medical bills, meaning the medical bills for his surgery never got paid. Further, Jack Gordon, John's entertainment manager, allegedly took advantage of him, meaning John barely got paid for the pornos. Yeah, he signed some contract he didn't read, and so the, the, oh, the broker... imagine the, that. I know. The broker took the, the broker took the money. After his failed porn career, John moved to Nevada, but trouble seemed to follow him. He was accused of domestic violence by a girlfriend there named Christina Elliott and sentenced to 60 days in the Clark County Jail in May of 1994. John's employment as a door greeter at the legal brothel The Bunny Ranch was also a failure. According to the staff, they couldn't trust him to do simple tasks like drive the company limo without wandering off or making mistakes. He also had an attitude problem, which was made worse when he drank. According to the Bunny Ranch co-workers, after three drinks, he would flip out and turn into a major asshole. Well, and you wonder why they would hire him, but because they are a legal brothel, brothel, they're not allowed to advertise. And so they thought, Dennis Hoff, the owner, thought, oh, if I hire John Wayne Bobbitt, he's in the media all the time. We'll get free advertisement or whatever. But at what cost? And again, why are you hiring a man that, even if he was acquitted... You've seen the trials. You've seen the evidence. It's pretty cut and dry that he raped and abused his, this woman for years. And now you're having him around all of these sex workers and women. At Yeah. That's that's so disgusting to me. Yeah. He had a proclivity to, to violence. I mean, we already yes. knew that. And then he starts You're putting drunk. all those women in danger. And guess what? He totally lived up to the job. I mean, lived up to the description. I mean, it's not like he had turned his life around. <laughs> John was eventually fired from the Bunny Ranch for drinking on the job. This didn't sit well with his family, who, according to the Lorena documentary, showed up at the home of the Bunny Ranch's manager, demanding for John to be rehired. The manager, Suzette, described it as a... A posse. That made her feel... Fearful. To the extent she had to get a restraining order. However, Dennis Hoff, owner of the Bunny Ranch, rehired him due to the media attention. 
they Dennis struggled. Hoff sounds like a sack of shit. Well, not shocking. But they, this woman who, she's Madam Suzette. I mean, she runs the place. I watched an entire documentary series. I believe it was on HBO a few years mm-hmm. back. All about the Bunny Ranch. And it was fascinating. Well, fascinating. and it's this woman. She is very protective. And she's protective oh, yes. of her place and protective of her workers. Mm-hmm. And she said these people rolled up in multiple cars and, like, surrounded her house like a siege. And were screaming at her and hollering at her to hire their kid back. And I say kid, he's an adult human yeah. now. I mean, he's grown up now. But like, again, who, yeah, who does that for their kid? No. Or for their, for their not, he's not a kid. He's in his no. 40s or something at this yes, point. For their uh, ne'er-do-well old man son. It's, it's, yeah. But again, that's they're just the type, trash people. Yeah, they're trash people. And he, that's again, like he was raised. Nothing's ever your fault. You're always the victim. Blah, blah, blah. And it just continues to go even into his adult life so yeah he's he's never put in a position where he has to take responsibility for his actions no and he shows up there going i can do whatever i want i'm a celebrity and when they're mm-hmm. like okay we actually need you to be a bartender he was so bad they had to have a supervisor with him all like he had to have a co-bartender he's drunk. you can't have a yes. drunk being a bartender you're no. just drinking the product all day pretty much the rehiring however would be short-lived as John was busted for theft and conspiracy for taking more than $140,000 worth of clothes from a store in Fallon, Nevada. He was arrested and made bail with the help of his bunny ranch boss, Dennis Hoff. A few days later was John's 32nd birthday. Hoff and the bunny ranch crew decided to throw a party for John at the ranch, including a cake, balloons, and lots of media attention. However, when it came time for the party to begin, John was missing. He had apparently skipped bail leaving Dennis Hoff on the hook for a substantial sum of money. God, of course. Oopsie. Yeah, well, I mean, what did you expect from this guy? I can't try. You can't even trust John Wayne Bobbitt. Man. (laughs) What's the world coming to when you can't trust John Wayne Bobbitt? When a good old-fashioned, hard-working brothel owner can't even (laughs) trust a multiply convicted domestic abuser. (laughs) We've also... Failed to talk about the fact that his parents named him John Wayne. <laughs> Come on now. What is going on? God. That's always so... I mean, it had to have been intentional. Also, his brother's name is Todd, so that's mean. Todd what? What famous Todd is there? <laughs> oh, man. Your name and is John Wayne, and they're like, Todd. <laughs> Todd. I, I have a... Todd William. I have a Todd a that I person. love. No, I have I mean, a Todd. Uh, we love the same Todd. We love the same Todd. Actually, Todd. I have a couple Todds that I love. Yeah, but celebrity Todds, I don't know. I don't, I try to think of a celebrity with the name Todd, and Just I the cannot band. think of one. Who? Big Head Todd is a band. Oh, Big Head, yeah, and the Monsters. Hmm. Whatever happened to them? Speaking of the 90s. They were around. Oh, yeah. I think they're still touring. I feel like I saw a poster for them the really? last time I was at House of Blues. Good for them. In 1998, John had met Desiree at the Bunny Ranch, a 19-year-old working girl. Their blossoming relationship was prohibited, according to the Bunny Ranch rules. After John skipped bail, the two moved to Niagara Falls, New York together, where Desiree paid to set him up with an apartment. John tried finding work as a limo driver and a carpenter, while continuing to look to Desiree for money. Meanwhile, Desiree commuted across country between where she lived in Nevada and John's place in Niagara Falls. Yet again, he finds a woman to support him. Yep. And a young one at that. He's 32. She's 19. Desiree told the documentary makers that when she tried ending things and transferring the apartment from being jointly rented to only John's name, he flew off the handle and beat her with anything that was loose in the apartment. He battered her and drug her down the hallway of their apartment complex. He pushed her over the edge of the balcony and dangled her by her legs. Passersby's witnessed the event. John then tied her up to the bed, stripped her, and repeatedly raped her, vaginally and anally. He told Desiree that she was his Lorena now and that she would never escape him. Yeah, that she gives this uh, account on the Lorena documentary, but her Desiree is a pseudonym and then yes. her face is blurred out. I understandably so. Completely. After three days of this horrific abuse, an exhausted Desiree eventually pretended to be dead. John reacted by simply gathering up sheets in order to wrap her dead body up. 
When John's back was turned and Desiree was untied, she ran for her life. After she went to the police, John was arrested for the harassment of Desiree, as the rape allegations did not come out until later. And in New York, harassment was a civil cause, but it did trigger his being on bail in Nevada. And so the the lady, the prosecutor from Niagara Falls basically called Nevada and said, hey, I got this guy. Like, we can arrest him. We'll extradite him to you. Because at the time, Desiree didn't come forward with the rape allegation. Three days. She was tortured. Tied to a bed, raped and tortured for three days. Three days. And no one helped the That's people. That's what I'm saying. Three days. You know, first of all, the neighbors saw him throw her over the balcony. They didn't do anything. They got to hear stuff going on for three days if somebody's been beaten raped next door to you in an apartment you're gonna hear something and never once did someone call the cops no the cops finally came around after she escaped and was asking people and nobody'd say nothing and one kid that was happened to be a little kid that was home from school had seen everything through a peephole and that's how they arrested john bobbitt gosh good for that kid weak ass people yeah i didn't see nothing after repeated charges of domestic violence against him brought by his second wife joanna farrell John spent 15 months in Lovelock Correctional Center, where he claims he was attacked for being a domestic abuser. In December of 2004, he was again accused of beating his third wife and her 14-year-old son, but was acquitted. Of his accusers, John said they all used him to advance their careers and continuously denies that he ever abused any of his wives or girlfriends. These women know they use law enforcement to their advantage claiming they threaten men with calling police if the women don't get their way. No, sir. (laughs) No, that's not that's not what's happened at all. No. Uh, It's so that we know of Lorena, Desiree, two different wives. Christina, the girlfriend. Christina and was Joanna the wife? No. Yes. Okay. So five that we know of yes. have said this guy either raped me, beat me, sexually assaulted me in some way. That's that we know of. Yes. It, there, it's this, There's no way that's where it ends. And no. somehow he's still just a, an innocent bystander in all of this. I was just wrongfully confused by crazy women. By five, no. five different crazy women. No. No, no. And it's, in, you know, he, he tries to portray it as, oh, you know, it was only, you know, a misunderstanding or I just I was defending myself. But then you have like the nine year old kid in Buffalo say, or in Niagara Falls saying, no, I saw him dra- punch her and kick her and drag yeah. her down the hallway by her ankles. That wasn't like a misunderstanding. And you were just like trying to save yourself. And then the same with Lorena. The photographs tell the story. I mean, she was covered this was not a simple misunderstanding and he just has a hot temper it's like this is a prolonged abuser i mean he's a serial abuser he's also an ex-marine yeah he's trained to know how to hurt people Choke he's him. also yes he's also trained to know how to defuse situations and to get so even if he he was being attacked by these women which i don't believe for a second he was He's bigger than them. He he would know how to just defuse the situation. Mm-hmm. He, he wouldn't need to go to the links that he went to, bloody their their faces. There's documented evidence of all of that to mm-hmm. stop to stop him from being the one that's bullied. He should have used his marine powers for good and not yes, evil. Yes, exactly. John told the New York Daily News in 2013 that while the doctors initially told him he may never have sex again. He, in fact, slept with over 70 women in the years after the incident. He explained simply, Being the most famous man to have his penis chopped off does have its advantages. It definitely has not hurt my love life. It, in fact, improved it. Some women get a kick out of saying they slept with John Wayne Bobbitt. I'm... I don't get that. I, I'm I'm not one of those women. That's definitely would not do it for me. Also, we kind of skipped over it, but his penis got all messed up because the Howard Stern incident, he found this doctor who was supposedly going to give him a penis enlargement, in fact, injected it with a bunch of fat. Yeah. So it made it all lumpy and messed up looking, and he had to have another surgery to fix it. So 
It's not, not that that's a thing. You know, it doesn't matter how good his penis is. Uh, don't, don't no, go he, near that. He then starred in a, another porn called mm-hmm. Franken Penis. That's right. That's right. Just rule of thumb. Don't sleep with a guy who's been in a porn that has the title Franken Penis. <laughs> Any sort of a uh, monster parody. No. You want to stay away from that guy. Ghost Dracula dick. Penis. Ghost Dick might be fun, though. Ghost, Ghost Dick I would watch, but maybe Count <laughs> Penis? I don't know. Count Dicula? Count Dicula's fun. Count Cocula. <laughs> so good. Instead of Count Chocula. Yeah, it's so Count much better. <laughs> so good. No, what was yours? That one was good, too. Yeah, Count Dicula. Now I'm just going to spend the rest of the night coming up with <laughs> monster <laughs> dick porn names. I bet we could get some... Uh, the Invisible Dick. The Invisible Dick is good. Uh, creature of the lagoon. Uh, penis, from, dick. penis from the black lagoon. <laughs> penis from the black lagoon. What are some? Uh, the mummy. The dick's just wrapped like a mummy. That's right. In the porn. <laughs> <laughs> Man, this these guy. probably all exist somewhere. Someone probably Tommy is like y'all know that these were already all made. Right? Damn it, because <laughs> Tommy There's knows his... everything. He does. Well, Lorena and Alan Halji decided to make a movie of Lorena's life, and Jana Bassetti, Lorena's boss at the nail salon, wanted a piece of the action. Allegedly, Jana had Lorena sign a contract in which Jana took 15% of Lorena's earnings. Eventually, Lorena had to cut ties with Jana entirely in order to try and live a normal life. I feel like Lorena was trying to find someone to trust. and Yeah, this was sad because Jana in the beginning was such a confidant of hers and, and kind of her, her guide and the only one there for her during the trial and everything. And then once the media started happening, even the coworkers at the nail salon were like, all she ever talked about was Lorena. She would just be on the phone with people all day trying to wheel and deal interviews for her. She wanted everyone to go through her. She would even say, well, you know, she wouldn't even have those clothes if it wasn't for me. I dressed her. I bought her everything. She kind of became just obsessed with mm. the the limelight of it all. And smartly, Lorena decided, nah, we can't be friends anymore. I got to yeah. move on with my life. She seemed like she more wanted to ex- have Lorena be able to exploit it. Maybe not exploit her totally, but then just got wrapped up and kind of greedy, it seems yeah. like. Yeah. Lorena began visiting domestic violence shelters, speaking to women as an advocate and sharing her story. Her newfound role as an advocate made her feel stronger and helped her on her path to healing. She went to college and met a kind man named David Bellinger. The two began a friendship, then fell in love. They had a daughter in 2006. She established the Lorena Gallo Foundation, also known as Lorena's Red Wagon. The foundation works with various community organizations, helping victims of domestic violence. She provides support, both financial and emotional, for women trapped in abusive situations. I think it kind of just started as a path to her own healing and then evolved into the foundation because she's just like, I just wanted to go and face to face tell people, you know, this isn't the way I took out. I could have lost everything. You know, I could have gone to jail. I wish I would have had these resources. And I just want you to know there is a way out that's not violent that you you have a place to go. Yeah, I uh, worked at a domestic violence shelter out of college for almost two years Mm -hmm. and it they are it's such a tight knit group there of women and someone coming and speaking like this that can share that type of camaraderie about mm-hmm. something so so horrible and in and courage and hope and everything just means the world to women in those situations mhm to be like i've been there and i made it out yeah yeah well, and a lot of the people that worked at the shelter were also former victims of domestic violence. So, you know, caseworkers and everything, they would be able to share their own stories with the women and everything. I think about that, that place a lot. It's powerful. It was. It was um, It was a very powerful experience and one that I, I enjoyed. Um, it's, it's very eye-opening and humbling to mm-hmm. – I mean, my – office was in the actual shelter i worked mm-hmm. the hotline when i first started working there where women would that was the first line when they call in and were experiencing something or needed to find a way there and then i was promoted to a caseworker where i actually did social work for them and everything mm-hmm. but um yeah it's 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 life-changing and eye-opening and uh i think about that place a lot 
In an interview with the Today Show in 2019, Lorena said John still sends her love notes on days like Valentine's Day, possibly as a way to try and exert control over her. On the Lorena documentary, Lorena read some of the letters John sent her, in which he calls himself a cold-hearted, insensitive, self-centered combat warrior. I should have been a kind, caring, sensitive, loving husband that understood my wife. He signed the letter, Your Eternal Flame. Go I wish fuck I, yourself. I wish I had a bucket to throw up in right now. <laughs> God, it's so controlling. It's shitty. Yep. It's having been in an abusive relationship, getting that email, that random email from the ex makes you sick. And you're like, I thought I blocked you on everything. Yeah. And seeing the face, you know, that they got a new Facebook profile and you're like, I thought I blocked you on everything. And He's also you sick. basically admitting that he, yeah. what he did. Yes, absolutely. And text messages shown on the documentary from John to Lorena said, we could make a lot of money if we got back together. An aged John tells the camera that the two of them getting back together would be the ultimate act of burying the hatchet. Meanwhile, Lorena told the filmmakers she wants John to just leave me alone. It's all about money and fame for him. Yep. He that's because he has no marketable skills. He's not no, charming. He's, he's an shitty. idiot. He's an idiot. He's shitty. He's never done anything useful in his life no. except for crime. And it's that's not even useful. That's the only way he's made money is exploitation and crime. So this is one other way for him to exploit himself and try to make money again. That's disgusting. Oh, yeah. Lorena continues her advocacy work through her foundation. In 2019, she told Variety, If I could save one life, then my mission is accomplished. She has also had a change of heart regarding the cruel and tasteless jokes told her about her in the mid-90s, telling the New York Times, I'll put myself through the jokes and everything as long as I can shine a light on domestic violence and sexual assault and marital rape. If you or someone you know is in an abusive relationship, please know that you are not alone and help is available. The number for the National Domestic Violence Hotline is 1-800-799-SAFE. So what do we think? Well, this woman is a strong warrior, especially oh saying she'd be willing to go through it again as long as she could save one life or help one person. That is that is amazing. And it shouldn't yeah. have to be. She shouldn't have to go through that. But that is, no, she's I mean, got she, a big heart. I think she had the best possible outcome for her. Uh, she's using what she went through for good to help others. She found a, a very nice man she's now married to, has a loving relationship a beautiful daughter and is partnering up her and amanda knox do stuff like mm -hmm. uh, have 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 been on each other's shows and everything um there was kind of a whole all of those women uh, monica lewinsky herself and and amanda knox like all the women that kind of had these thrust into the spotlights and were shamed shamed and just i saw an article where a the author referred to it as bitchified, mm -hmm. which is what uh, just this term that she said, like all these women, Amanda Knox wasn't in the 90s, but all these women in the 90s kind of went through like Tanya Harding in included that too, where it was just all chalked up to they're just psychotic bitches. Mm -hmm. And that's all Crazy the media. Women. Yeah, that's what the media ran with and everything. So it's nice to see that like they're also finding like solace and, and healing through each other because they all know mm -hmm. what it feels like to be just raked over the media coals and for, mocked and yeah yeah every and, part and, of you mocked and all you want to do is scream from the hills what really happened mm -hmm. and get the and get the true story out there and the uh producer and and director of this documentary did a great job of getting her story out there and i mm -hmm. hope i hope that howard stern apologizes now if he's turned a corner over the past few years and this has come out now and there's a million articles uh just saying what a piece of shit he was to her hopefully something good comes out of that too yeah there's nothing i mean it's like i said i'm all here for somebody healing and growing but there's something to be said for an apology for an acknowledgement mm -hmm. and an apology i think that's part of healing and growing and that's mm -hmm. also helping someone the person that you wronged heal as well true Well, we love providing Sinisterhood to you at no cost. So if you like what you hear, consider supporting the show by donating to our Patreon. We're a small operation. 
creating the show for you by researching, writing, recording, and producing it ourselves. Any amount is sincerely appreciated and helps offset the cost of making and hosting the show. As a thank you, you'll also get some sweet perks like Sinisterhood sticker, membership to our exclusive Patreon Facebook group, and those in the Ruling the Airwaves tier, a special shout out on the show, a monthly bonus mini-sode, and Patreon-exclusive video and audio content, like our weekly mix bags where we share three of our favorite things of the week. For more details on specific membership tiers, visit Sinisterhood.com and click Patreon in the top right corner to join today. And make sure you stick around after our sign-offs to hear your shout-out. So many of you have been tagging us in pictures of you sporting your sweet Sinisterhood merch. Keep those pictures coming. If you want to get some cool Sinisterhood swag like t-shirts, mugs, totes, and even clothes for your kiddos, and the really cool ringer tee that Christy has on featuring art by Christine Burchett, <laughs> or the Donna Laser and the Meat Warlocks that the in-studio skeleton is currently wearing, mm-hmm. head to Sinisterhood.com and click on Shop in the top right corner. And for the month of April, 100% of profits from merch sales will go to the World Health Organization COVID-19 Solidarity Response Fund. The best thing you can do to help us grow is like, review, and subscribe on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen to your podcasts. And please tell a friend who you think would like us to check us out. It means so much to us and really helps small podcasts like us get more exposure. You can follow us on Instagram and Twitter at Sinisterhood Pod and like us on Facebook at Sinisterhood Christy. I am on Twitter at Christy or GTFO, and I am on Instagram at Christy M. Wallace. Heather? I am on Instagram at Heather vs. the World and on Twitter at MCK vs. the World. As always, the devil rules the airwaves. And keep it creepy. Hey, everybody. Thanks so much for sticking around, and thank you so much for supporting the show on Patreon. Here are your special Patreon shoutouts. Jordan. Thea Sigvaldson. Allison Voigt. Sarah. Brittany Butcher. Megan. R. Green. Quinn Riley. Hallie Smith. Samantha Salter. Jessica Ducas. Aline. Sarah Bray. Logan Spain. Hannah Nolling. Nicola Loder. Kelsey Flefson. Cassie Varn. Rachel Barsky. Bianca. Meryl Daniels. Noel S. Tracy Leach. Katie Packer. Samantha R. Pina. Mariah Clark. Amanda Knox. Heidi Elsie. Sarah Wall. Nicole Foster. Kimberly. Carrie Higgins. Nikel Reed. Thank you guys so much for your support. It means so much to us. We couldn't do this without you. Please stay safe, healthy, and keep it creepy. Sinister food.